Hello everyone. So as Raj said, um, John chapter 9, uh, 1 to 12 is the first part of the reading. Uh, and then we will skip ahead to verse 35. As he was passing by, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples questioned him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he left, washed, and came back seeing. His neighbours and those who formerly had seen him as a beggar said, Isn't this the man who sat begging? Some said, He's the one. No, others were saying, but he looks like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. Therefore they asked him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So when I went and washed, I received my sight. Where is he? they asked. I don't know, he said. Now down to verse 35. When Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out, he found him and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? he asked. Jesus answered, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, in order that those who do not see will see, and those who do see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, We aren't blind too, are we? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. Thanks, Deanne. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Murray. I look around the room. There's a half a dozen people at least. I don't know. So, good day. I'm Murray. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm part of the ministry staff uh, here at church. My privilege to open this bit of the Bible uh, together this morning. Now, let me tell you, the other day, um, I was driving down the M4. Everyone knows the M4? Just over there. It was this bright, sunny morning. Um, it had just rained not long before. Everything looked clean. Everything looked shiny, kind of plasticky even, and it was strange. I had this kind of strange series of thoughts go through my head as I was driving. It feels like I'm in a toy car, driving along some fantastic playset, and I can see you know, the power lines powering this little playset, and there's all these highways funneling these little toy people to their toy workplaces and toy houses. And too busy, too entertained to see that we're all just little ants in the big machine. And, you know, who are we really? This all went through my head in a couple of seconds. I was like, whoa. Then I realized I really should pay attention to where I'm driving because I was going very fast. But uh, it's just a strange kind of little, what is reality kind of thought? Have you ever had those thoughts or is that just me? Just me? Okay, all right. I should see someone. All right. All right. What are we? Is what, is what we see truth? Do we look out and do we see reality? Are we living in the, the Matrix or the Truman Show or something like that? Or a computer simulation? Now, you might think this is ridiculous, right? But some serious scientists have studied this in some serious depth. The question, are we a computer simulation? Uh, scientist and science communicator Neil deGrasse Tyson puts the odds at 50-50, right? 50-50 that we actually exist on someone's hard drive. <laughs> That's big odds. Um, not, not everyone agrees with him, right? Some want to play it safe. They say, look, the worst thing you can do is ask this question, right? 
Because if you figure out you're a simulation and the simulators find out, they'll shut you down. Uh, Max Tegmark is a cosmologist at MIT, has different advice, says, get out there, do interesting things. Because if you do interesting things, no one's going to shut you down. So, uh, you know, if it was true, right? If this was true, would you want to know? I think it's an interesting idea. I think it's rubbish, right? But, but, but it's fun to think about. I find it fun to think about. What if there's a reality that we can't see? A reality maybe we don't want to see. Uh, the truth is, though, that there's lots of situations in our, our life, in our day-to-day life, where we don't see clearly, we don't see reality uh, for what it is. Where there's a deeper truth that we just don't know. Maybe we don't want to know it. Maybe we have a blindness to something. Now, for some of us, um, we have physical sight issues. Some of you need really strong glasses. And the worst thing in the world is trying to find your glasses because you need your glasses to find your glasses. And, and you can't find them because you don't have them. And then you go and clean your teeth with nappy cream or something like that. If you, I don't know. This is, I've heard of these things happening. But, but where it gets dangerous, right, if someone needs glasses and doesn't know it and then wants to get behind the wheel and drive, that's a problem. But it's not, not just physical blindness that's an issue. There's a danger in not seeing reality for what it is. Not seeing what's coming, not wanting to see. Um, some of you watching the latest series of Survivor? A few of you, yes. And Survivor, they, they always talk about when they, when they get voted off and they didn't see it coming, what do they call it? Blindsided. That was a lot. That's good. More people watch it than admit it the first time. You get blindsided. Now, they overuse the word. I mean, just because you didn't see it coming doesn't mean you're blindsided. But, but, but you, you, you didn't see what was coming to get you. But you can be blindsided in business. You know, all the signs are showing that your industry is going down, but you don't look at them and don't want to face the truth. Maybe you see your friends or your kids or someone making bad decisions and you know, it's blindingly obvious what they should do, but they can't see it. They should see what's coming, but they go down the wrong path. Dangerous blindness. Sometimes blindness we choose for ourselves, even. Uh, we've been in John quite a while ago. I don't even, can't even remember when. But we're back into the story, partway through um, the story of Jesus told by his friend and, and follower, John. And we see Jesus meeting a blind man. Jesus, just for some context, has come out of um, the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and, and on one night, um, the story goes that, that the, the Feast of Tabernacles has a, a celebration with, with lights in through the, the temple. And Jesus, not long before this story, is in the temple, horribly filled with lights, and has declared, standing up saying, I am the light of the world. And then after he says that, he's arguing with the Pharisees and and he's making crazy claims to saying, when God created the world, I was there. I was there when God created the world. And they're so mad at him for saying that. They're saying, it's blasphemy, you can't say that. And they try and kill him. But he gets away. And the way that John puts the story together, the way he crafts it, is the next thing we see after that episode is Jesus coming across this man without sight. A man born blind, and as we saw, he healed him. But in this healing and in what follows after this healing, we see that the, the more serious blindness is not the physical blindness, it's the blindness you don't know you have and the blindness we can't admit. We'll see that in the Pharisees and we'll see that probably in ourselves too. We'll see the amazing power of Jesus to heal, to bring light and life, but we'll also see the blindness, we'll see the blindness that he can't heal and the people he can't save. So we're going to look at the healing, and the healer. Got an outline in your handout if that's helpful to you. But we're going to look at the healer. Sorry, the healing and the healer. So in this background of the festival of light in the temple, Jesus walks out and meets a man who's never seen light in his life, never seen any light. And and it's just Jesus and the disciples at this stage. The blind man's over there, and the disciples ask him a question. They say, "Teacher, Rabbi, who sinned that this man was is blind? Is it?" Is it his sin? Is it his parents' sin? And it's a common way of thinking. We think about that even now. People get what they deserve, or at least other people should. But Jesus says, no, no, that's not the case. It's neither. It's not about sin. This man in his brokenness, in his darkness and lostness, is about to show the glory of God in his life. 
about to show the, the glory of God in his, uh, in his life. Uh, he says, your eyes, disciples, you're seeing, you're seeing judgment and suffering, but I'm the light of the world, like I've just told you. And while light is here, it's daytime, and in daytime we get to work. So let's get to work. Let's show the glory of God in this man. And they walk towards him. I wonder as they walk towards him and we walk with him, I wonder if you can relate at all to this blind man. Feelings of brokenness, of lostness, of darkness. Wondering perhaps, is the pain I'm in my fault? Is it me? Do other people think that it's my fault, what's going on? But I wonder, as Jesus walks towards him, we might get a little glimmer of hope. Because in this broken, lost, darkened life, God is about to show his glory. Now the glory of God, whatever. No, no, the glory of God, God's goodness. God's beauty, God's transforming power, that glory that last week we saw blinded Paul. We saw that last week, or saw all the time. We're going to see that. We're going to see God's glory in this man's life. We might see it in our lives too. We might see it in your life as God, as Jesus goes to work. So Jesus goes to work and he spits in the ground and he makes mud with some of his spit and the dirt. Doesn't seem very glorious so far. It's not a good start. And then he, and he walks up to the blind man and smears it all over his useless eyes. I kind of hope you warned the man. <laughs> if you're in the medical profession, this is not good bedside manner. Um, but if you just turn up and smear mud on someone's eyes. But I, 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 I bet that this man had, had blind eyes but had sharp ears and could hear what was going on beforehand. So much so that when he hears the man who's just smeared mud on his eyes tell him, go to the wash in the pool of Siloam. He goes. He obeys. No questions asked as far as we see. Siloam, we're specifically told, means sent. And so when the the man is sent to the pool called sent by the man sent by God, off he goes. And it's frustratingly, beautifully brief what happens next, what we're told. Verse 7, So he left, washed, and came back seeing. He left, washed, and came back seeing. I just, I just wish we had a little bit more information here. Like, oh, the Bible reading was long enough. But I, want, I want more. Uh, what happened? You just see the blind man stumbling the half a K or a bit, bit more from, from probably the temple down to the pool of, of Siloam. And I wonder if he's being led or if he's just feeling his way there. He's got mud down his face and people are staring. Not, not that he notices or, or cares at this point. And then... To get to the pool and to wash, get the mud out of his eyes, and then then to open his eyes. Imagine seeing for the first time in your entire life. Can you imagine what that's like? I can't imagine what that's like. Light. To see light where there's been darkness, to see faces. That's what people look like. Um, And and, and the sky, maybe trees and and buildings, see your own hands. This This is what I look like. This is what I'm wearing. I didn't know this is my color. What is, what is going on? To look up and see the massive temple over there in the distance. The temple, you know you've sat out there for, for years and years and years begging. And he heads back towards the temple. I don't know how he made his way back. I mean, I wonder. I wonder if he ran. So he never ran in his life before. I want to know what happened. But all we're told is he left, he washed, and he came back seeing. And of course he came back. He wanted to see this person who would, who would help him to see. He knew it was Jesus, but he hadn't seen him yet. He just wants to see Jesus, but Jesus isn't there. He can't see Jesus. But friends, we just saw Jesus, didn't we? Oh boy, did we see Jesus just then. Now, you may wish in your minds, oh, you hadn't seen someone spit in the ground and wipe mud on someone's face. But we did, and we saw what happened. And so what do we learn about Jesus in this moment? See, in this really compact, brief way, Jesus says so much. He says, I'm God. He says, I'm from God. I'm the one. I'm the rescuer. I wonder if you can remember how John starts the, his whole story of Jesus. Back in John chapter 1, famous words, going back to the beginning of the world. In the beginning was the Word. Now, when he talks about Word, he means Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things back then were created through him. Apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. 
In him was life. And get this. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Life and light are very linked in John's gospel. Uh, th- that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. So we fast forward to John 9, where we pick up the story today, and the crowds just tried to kill him for saying, I'm the light of the world. They just tried to kill him for saying, I was there when God created the world. And so he's showing them, look, that's really me. Let me show you. Let me show you. Remember God that uh, spoke into the darkness and said, let there be light at that moment of creation? Well, here I am saying, let there be light in the eyes of this blind man, in the darkness of him. I can bring light in the darkness, Jesus says. Remember the God who, who from uh, the, the mud of the ground breathed life into it and, and, and made humankind? Remember him? Well, watch me take the dust of the ground and, and, and put it on this man's eyes and bring light to him because I'm the light that brings life. I bring life. I am the light of the world. He echoes the great I am. That I am, that Old Testament name of God, Yahweh, literally, I am. He says, that's me. And, I, and, and more than that, I'm the one you've waited for ever since Isaiah prophesied and, and of the coming Savior. Uh, Isaiah 35, 5. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. That's me. I am here. There's none like me. No one has done this before. Uh, as the healed man later says, throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. It's a little story. But it's huge. It's the amazing glory of Jesus. Jesus, the unique Son of God from the beginning. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I am the light that brings life. We get to see Jesus. But back then, the man couldn't see Jesus. He disappeared somewhere. But, you know, someone was blind and now can see. Well, that draws a crowd, right? Right? That draws a crowd. And, and so um, a crowd gathers around and they can see this man. And, and here's the funny thing, right? As soon as this man can see, no one else can believe their eyes. As soon as this man can see, no one else can believe their eyes. Let's look at their responses. And we start with the response of the cynical crowd. Hey, this guy. Isn't he the guy that used to sit begging? Oh, no, it can't be. Yeah, but... But it looks like him. Yeah, well, just, oh, I don't know. And all the time he's saying, yes, no, no, that's me. You're right. I was the guy and now I can see that's me. And they're like, hmm, how did that happen? He tells a story. Jesus, you know, put mud in my eyes, told me to go to Silo. I washed. I came back. I can see. Hmm. No, it doesn't sound right, does it? No, that can't be right. Can't be right. Sorry. I, I, I can't quite believe it. Let's, let's take this guy to the Pharisees. I, I can't figure this out. Let's go to the Pharisees. They can sort this joker out. The cynical crowd see, but they can't believe. So take them to the the proud, prideful Pharisees, the religious bigwigs of the day, and they show this man born blind, and they ask him how it happened, and he tells the story again. He tells the story a lot over this this chapter. One of the Pharisees steps forward, takes out his notebook, I'm guessing. Uh, Excuse me, uh, you see, this actually can't be a good thing, you know? Because technically, look at the date, this is all happening on the Sabbath. Our day of rest where we don't work. And technically, uh, making mud or kneading clay, as we we, we put it, is technically work. And work that's prohibited under the Sabbath code, under section 7, subpoint 2b of the Pharisee Sabbath code updated last August. This can't be good. It's against the Sabbath. But even the Pharisees are divided. How can, how can healing a guy not be good? Hey, they ask him, so um, ex, ex-blind guy, uh, who do you say Jesus is? In verse 17, he says, oh, he's a prophet. Ah, this man who's gone from blindness to sight is starting to see who Jesus is. Jesus is a prophet. Yes, more than a prophet, but this guy is getting there. The Pharisees, on the other hand, are not. They don't buy it. The prideful Pharisees call in the petrified parents. Uh, and they, they, they call in to explain it all. And the parents say, yes, I can, can confirm, this is our son. Uh, 
yes, he was born blind. I distinctly remember it. That, that's true. How was he healed? I don't know. We can't say. Uh, you should ask him. He's old enough to answer. I think it's one of the real human tragedies of this story. This, is a, this, this should be a day of great joy for these parents, shouldn't it? Their son's been blind for all their life. They've been reduced to begging, probably bringing shame on, on their family. And now he can see, but they can't rejoice in their own son's healing. Because the Pharisees had already decided anyone who says Jesus is anything good, anyone who follows Jesus, they're out. Cut off. Red card. Out of the game. Can't come to the synagogue. Cut off from your meeting place with God. Cut off from your community hub of your town. The parents couldn't see the goodness of Jesus. They couldn't rejoice. They'd be banned from even trying to see Jesus. So the prideful Pharisees not make much progress. They strike out again, but they don't give up. I'm going to read again from the bit that we missed out before. John chapter 9, verse 24. So, a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind and told him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. He answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. I don't know. One thing I do know. I was blind, and now I can see. And they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Oh, I already told you. I already told you, he said. And you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples, do you? They ridiculed him. You're that man's disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know God spoke to Moses, but this man, we don't even know where he came from. This is an amazing thing, said the man. This is amazing. You don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. Now we know God doesn't listen to to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing, he does his will, he listens to him. Throughout history, no one's ever heard of someone opening the eyes of someone born blind. If this man weren't from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. Oh, fair enough, said the Pharisees. Good point. Take your points on board. We see now. No, they don't say that. You were born entirely in sin, they replied. And you're trying to teach us. And they threw him out. They threw him out. They chucked him out. There's a clash, right, between the Pharisees and this man who... uh, uh, The Pharisees who refuse to see and this man who only knows that I couldn't see and now I can see. He's a sinner, the Pharisees say. I don't know. All I know is I can see. (laughs) I couldn't... Because I'm not from God do that? Well, 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 you're the sinner. You, you must be. You're born blind. You must be the sinner. Get out of here. Don't try and teach us. And they threw him out and they refused to see and they closed their eyes. Have you ever played hide and seek with a child? Anyone? And they're not very good at it. And so they will hide like behind this chair. And you know where they are. But you want to string the game out a little bit. You want to say, oh, I found you. Sucked in. My turn. No, no, you want to spread the game out. And you're like, where could they be? Are they in the cupboard? Are they in the fridge? Are they in the, are they in the toilet? Like, where, where, where are they? And all that, what are they saying all this time? I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Fine, that's my much on to that. I'm here. This is the Pharisees, right? Let's, uh, it might be someone else. He looks, it could look different. Uh, let's ask the parents. Maybe they can say that this is not true. Ah, uh, oh, it's the Sabbath. This can't be, can't be right. Oh, you must be a sinner. And what's the guy doing? I was blind, but now I can see. I'm here. Look at me. They can't see what's right in front of their eyes. Now, as we see this story, what, what, do, we, what, what do we do for that? How do, what do we, where do we take that? What, what, what's, what's that for us? I think in some ways it's kind of obvious because we shouldn't be like those Pharisees. We should be those who see Jesus properly who see him for who he really is. So we need to be the ones who open our eyes, stare in his face, and bow down in worship. Open your eyes. Believe. Worship. See Jesus. That's what we've got to do, right? That's what we've got to do. But you can't. And you won't. And what's more, you don't want to. 
Why? Well, because we're actually like that blind man. Helpless and in the dark. We, we just can't just see any more than a, a, a blind person could just see. And our hearts are as confused and as out of order and back to front as the cynical crowd and the prideful Pharisees and the petrified parents. We can't just decide to see. Now, our hearts here aren't all the same. I don't, you know your heart. I don't know your heart. Some of our hearts see different things. Some of us have seen Jesus in, in his glory and some of us have not. There may be people here who've never called Jesus their Lord, never seen him for who he is. And it's not just as simple as saying, well, then see, look. Jesus needs to act for the blind man. He needs to act for you too. And if you've been following Jesus for years and years and years and years and years, he has opened your eyes. You've seen his glory. You know who he is. You still know how hard it is uh, to keep your eyes open. You still know how easy it is for your eyes to drift shut, for our sight to be clouded. As our heart looks away from the face of Jesus, as your heart loves the things which cloud your vision of him, as your heart loves the things that blind you to the reality of Jesus. So I can't just tell you, go on, look at Jesus. You're on your own, go for it. Because that's what's going on here in the story. Why can't the Pharisees see what is blindingly obvious? Why can't the parents rejoice in the great work of Jesus? Because they're afraid. And their fear trumps it. There is deep fear in their hearts. What is fear? Now, fear, according to the great theologian Augustine, fear is that, that, that feeling when there's something that you love and you, and you worry about losing it. You think it might get taken from you. That's fear. Fear is when there's something that you desire or love and you, you might not get it. That's fear. There's a lot more in that, but that'll do for now. Like, you see how fear comes from love? Fear is linked with our heart's deepest desires. Let me show you. The, the, the parents and the crowds, right? Their, their identity is, is in being part of the, the community. It's, it's having access to the synagogue. Their hearts long for that. And so they fear it being taken away from them. See that? In fear, they close their eyes to God's work in Jesus. And we have that same fear in our hearts. Because we love acceptance, don't we? We love uh, people uh, in our family and friends and community to accept us. We fear losing that. We fear that opening our eyes to Jesus might change how other people will see us. So you close your eyes to Jesus. Perhaps you close off, maybe not your entire eyes, but just a little bit of your life. Jesus, you can have most of it, but this bit is for me, maybe my work life. I can act how I want and be who I want to be here, but don't touch that, Jesus. Maybe my TV watching life. That, that's for me, Jesus. Stay out. It's a bit different for the, for the Pharisees, right? The prideful Pharisees, what do they love in their hearts? They love being in control. They love that feeling of being the masters of the law, the keepers of the law. They love the position they have in society as they are looked up to as they have power. They love the fact that they can look at themselves in the mirror and be satisfied. They have their own self-respect. Don't these loves sit deep in our hearts too? We want to be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and be happy with who we are. We love knowing that we are better than other people. I'm not pointing at anyone in particular. We love knowing that we are better than other people, that we're doing better than them. That's why we watch the network news and Current Affair and RBT and all those shows that rip people to shreds for making mistakes so we can feel better about ourselves. And we fear our own faults being made known. What if that was us there? on the current affair, with our secrets and lives and what really goes on in our head being revealed to the nation and the world. We love our power and our honour in our families and our workplaces, our communities and even in our church. We love being looked up to. It's a bit awkward as you all look up at me on this stage here, but, but it's that idea. It's, it's tricky, isn't it? I know this deeply in my own heart. I like to be liked. I like to 
be significant. Let me tell you a little story. In um, December, I did a little guest speaking um, thing at a friend's church. They asked me to come, the Christmas Eve family service thing. And, and it was great. I was really happy to be able to go and serve them that way. It was a great opportunity. Um, and a couple things about this church, right? This church, they're very good at social media. Very good at, you know, um, great design and keeping up to date and communicating um, what, they, what they're doing to, to the world. And I, and I knew that as I was speaking, there was a photographer out there taking some, taking some photos and, and, you know, I tried not to worry about him too much as I was there. But what worried me really was my kind of behaviour in the weeks following this, right? So I found as I was just casually on Facebook scrolling through, I found myself checking their page quite regularly. More than I really should have. And I'm just kind of wondering, oh, they haven't put anything about when I visited there. They took photos. Um, they posted about things after I was there. What's going on? Did, did, didn't I do a good job? Did the photos not come out? Was my fly down? I don't know. What, what's, the, what's, what's, the, what's the problem? Like, and it was just confronting to realise it's about myself. Because I realised that I wanted to be noticed beyond those walls. It, it wasn't enough for me to have served those saints there. I kind of wanted others to know. I wouldn't have minded you guys knowing, you know? If I'm honest, I think I wanted a bit more glory for myself. Isn't that lame? Isn't that silly? Now, I don't tell you this so you think, hey, cool, Murray did a speaking game. I'm not trying to make up for my lost publicity from before. No, it's not the point of this now. I want you to see how subtly and even how seriously we can close our eyes to Jesus. How darkness so subtly exists even in our own hearts. How deeply we're shaped by the things that we fear and that we love. I loved myself and my glory more than I loved Jesus and his glory in that moment. This came out in my pride. I love my reputation. I feared being overlooked. I feared being underappreciated. It's so stupid when I say that, isn't it? So stupid. So silly. And yet it's one of a hundred ways that my pride shows itself from time to time all too often. Isn't this rubbish just to clog our hearts up? So we close our eyes to Jesus. We block him out of just, just parts of our lives. We prefer the darkness to the light. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what I did. I'm guessing I'm not alone in this, in this room. We, we, we fear the light of Jesus. Because we're worried about what it might show us. We want to be able to think well of ourselves, like the Pharisees and the parents and everyone. We want to look in the mirror and feel good about ourselves. And Jesus can challenge that. Because Jesus can reveal the darkness in our hearts. And reveal our blindness. And reveal the bits we don't want to see and we don't want other people to see. So you see how it's not enough for me to have finished a while ago and saying, just go and see Jesus better. Go open your eyes. Go do it yourself. You, You can't do it under your own strength. There's only so long on the highway that you can force your eyes to stay open um, before they close and you crash. Just like the blind man can't open his own eyes, we can't open ours uh, to Jesus either. We need Jesus to find us and to give us sight. The blind man needed Jesus, not just to see, but to, to see him. And Jesus came and found him. Verse 35, Jesus heard they'd thrown the man out. And when he found him, he asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? He asked. Jesus answered, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. It's me. I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshipped him. Now the man really sees. He really sees. He sees, uh, he sees and he believes. He trusts. He has faith in Jesus. And he responds in worship, in love, in the affection of his heart. Jesus is not just a prophet, but but, but Lord, but king. King of his heart. And a king who's come to judge. Verse 39, straight away Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment, in order that those who do not see will see, and those who do see will become blind. Now the Pharisees hang around, they heard him say this. What? We're not blind too, are we? They said. If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. 
problem is you can't admit your blindness. That's dangerous. Jesus comes into the world for judgment so the blind can see, so that those who say they can see are shown to be truly blind. And the thing you're judged on is how you see Jesus. That's what you're judged on. Is he son of God? Is he object of your heart's greatest love? Do your eyes see him for who he is? This really matters. But again, I can't just say, go open your eyes. Go on, open your eyes. That doesn't work. What does work? Well, we see Jesus coming in judgment. The Pharisees are judged as blind. The blind man is given true sight. But we know this is not the end of the story because we know Jesus is heading towards judgment himself. Judgment where he's not sitting in the judge's seat, but the judgment that falls on him. Jesus is heading towards judgment for who? In the place of who? In the place of the blind, the blind people, for those who don't know he is Lord, who don't see, who refuse to see, for those whose hearts are far from him. He's going to judgment for them, for you, for me. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is the one who sees most clearly, will suffer in the place of those who have closed their eyes to him. Jesus, the light that brings life, will step into darkness and death in the place of those who really deserve it, you and me. The one who's always been able to see the face of the Father is going to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As his sight is cut off. Walks the path of the blind, walks towards his death. Why? So that we who have closed our eyes to him can have them opened. So that we who have closed our eyes to light that brings life can be rescued from darkness and rescued from death. Those like you and me who bear the weight of our sin and rebellion can have taken off our shoulders and dealt with by Jesus. Yes, you need to open your eyes. Yes, you need to see Jesus for who he is, but you can only do that as he takes your place in judgment, as he then holds out light to you and life to you, this free gift of grace. So do we just do nothing? No, no, we're called to respond. We're called in obedience, just like uh, the blind man was told to go and wash, and so he went and washed. We listen, we obey. We say, thank you for this gift. Please, please show us your, your way. I'm going to think more about responding to Jesus uh, next week, but we've got to think about the danger of the response of the Pharisees here. We can see. We're okay. We don't need Jesus. I'm okay with my heart. I'm okay with what I see in the mirror. I don't need Jesus. See, that's the unforgivable sin, isn't it? Covering your eyes and saying, it's okay, I've got this, I can see, give me the keys. If you refuse a cure, there's no cure left. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I've gone through darkness, I've gone through death. So you don't have to. Now open your eyes and see me clearly. Open your eyes uh, to see your own heart clearly. Let me in there to rearrange things, to sort things out. Let me help you see that your fear comes from loving what other people think about you too much. See me and love me instead and you'll be free of that fear. Let me help you see that your fear comes from loving yourself too much or even hating yourself too much. Both a a self-obsession rather than Christ's obsession, but that's a whole other topic we don't really have time to go into today. But, But Jesus says, see me, love me, and you'll be free of that fear. Now, we're going to talk about our responses to Jesus over the coming weeks. But now it's time for us to pray. We're going to pray. I'm um, going to get on our knees, so to speak. Not much room for you down in there. But, uh, and, and pray to God that God would work in our hearts so that we might see him clearly. That we might know him, know his love for us, and that our loves and our hearts will be shaped to love him in return. And that this perfect love will drive out blindness and darkness and fear in our hearts. Friends, why don't, why don't you pray with me? Father, we... we Read in Corinthians, Second Corinthians, that 
that those who look at the glory of Jesus are transformed ourselves from, from glory to glory as we see Jesus. But Father, we know that we can only see if uh, you open our eyes. Father, we ask that you would act in our hearts, rearrange our loves, open our eyes that we might see Jesus properly. Father, you only take away our blindness truly away and sin away, not as we open our own eyes, but as you take our blindness and sin in our place on the cross. And Father, we're just so sorry that we keep closing our eyes to you, that we keep adding to that pile of, of, of sins and rebellion that took you to the cross in the first place. Father, maybe be those who don't close our eyes to you or pretend we can see, but please, opening them, may we see you as the Son of God, see Jesus as the Son of God. May we see you as Lord, may we worship you as you take first place in our hearts. Father, please do this work in the hearts of us as we've gathered here today. Please keep doing this work uh, all our journey through. And pray that be, well, I do pray that you'll be doing this work uh, even now. And pray all these things uh, in the name of Jesus who brings light from darkness and who brings life from death. We pray. Amen.